Good morning. I'm Larry J. Repka, CEO of the Valmark Financial Group. And this morning, I'm going to discuss the next evolution of Index Universal Life, what's called proprietary indexes. Many promoters of these indexes would have you believe that they now have a special recipe for outperforming markets with little or no downside. This morning, I'm gonna demonstrate that that recipe for most of these indexes is really meatloaf with a lot of breadcrumbs. Last month, Valmark posted a comment letter with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners on this very topic. The NAIC is beginning its third attempt to restrain abusive index universal life sales. So why is this different than the ledger line my dad wrote about 35 years ago? Well, really two reasons. First, the scale of the lie. As I look at some of these IUL policies and what they promise, some might call it a triple Pinocchio. Second, is the outsize impact these plans have on consumers if they're premium financed. A significant portion of the IUL market involves tricking individuals, small businesses, and even charities into borrowing millions of dollars from banks to pay huge premiums on IUL. These proposals promise that the insurance cash value will grow not only enough to pay back the bank loan, but also produce free insurance death benefits or lifetime tax-free income. As we review more and more of these plans that are in force, it's evident that this strategy just doesn't work. Leverage cuts two ways. And when you borrow money to buy these products, it not only creates a more expensive insurance plan, but it also causes a risk of significant loss of collateral that's pledged against these loans. The use of proprietary indexes just disguises the problem and makes it more complicated. So before we get into proprietary indexes and what you need to know, let's review Index Universal Life again. IUL is a general account life insurance product. Now the general account is invested 95% or more in bonds and mortgages. Credits to the product are produced by a formula that's in the contract, usually the S&P 500 index. Unlike variable policies, the cash value is not directed in the equities, nor are the products regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission or FINRA. In fact, I think it is the absence of securities regulation that goes a long way to explain the abuses. There is arbitrage, but it's not financial arbitrage, it's regulatory arbitrage. With only the state insurance regulation at work, the consumer is expected to read the contract, understand their risks, so there's less disclosure than with a prospectus and there is little or no enforcement for disappointed consumers. As I indicated, Earlier, up until recently, most IUL policies have had an index based on the S&P 500. The policyholder got some percentage of the upside in this index, limited by a cap. Now, the combination of lower interest rates and higher options costs have brought the cap on all IUL policies down considerably. Some IUL policies now only have one half the original cap, and some have dropped to as low as 7% and they're still falling. This means dramatically lower cash values and lower credits that don't allow the projections to projected cash value to repay the bank loan and provide the promised benefits. Sellers of IUL, and especially premium financed IUL, have responded with a new pitch. Ignore the S&P 500. We now have a proprietary index, and this index is better than the S&P 500 index. Some of the claims that we've seen is that the index is a fund that is tracked 
to exceed the performance of the S&P 500 or that it's managed by a major investment bank. Promoters would say these index don't have caps like the S&P 500 index. Well, let's explore these things with a little more detail. First, this appearance of higher historical returns results from something called backtesting. So these, uh, form, these indexes didn't really exist back to the time when they were shown. It's a formula that investment banks came up with and said, had we done certain things at certain times, it would have resulted in this return. And then that formula is projected forward. Now, one of the real reasons insurance companies are moving to proprietary indexes is that locks in cost for the insurance company. At times of high volatility, there's less exposure to the market and less cost for options. So at those times, money would have been allocated into bond funds or a 1% bucket. So let's summarize the three objections in my letter to NAIC. First, these indexes are highly complex. As you see, the next two screens here, I'm showing an example of one of these indexes that I had accompany my letter to the NAIC. The formula covers 11 pages and how the index is credited to cash value. You can see this is very, very complex math, not understood by most consumers or the agents selling them. Second, Backtesting is misleading and creates inflated expectations about the level of credits the policy will get. I show here an example of actual returns on an index that has been in effect for five years, the JP Morgan Mosaic Index. As you can see, once actual returns kicked in, they're significantly less than projected and significantly less than the S&P 500 crediting less than an average of 4%. Finally, this is a little tricky. Proprietary indexes allow insurance companies to go back to using many of the outlawed bonuses and multipliers that AG49A was meant to eliminate. Now, how does that happen? Because the options prices are locked in for the insurance companies, they quote, have excess options budgets to fund the very bonuses and multipliers that were outlawed. This results in illustrations that can produce as much as 60% more projected cash value and loans than just the typical S&P 500 index. But they also introduce the ability for the insurance company to take away much of the upside that the consumer is experiencing by reallocating into um, bonds and general accounts. Well, a complicated subject just got a lot more complicated. I think that ethical insurance producers should look at these products with great skepticism and make sure that they really understand and can explain to the consumer what they're getting. At the Valmark Financial Group, we help bring the golden rule to life by helping ethical advisors help their clients make informed decisions about insurance products. This means calling out gimmicks and misinformation, even when it comes from insurance companies that we would otherwise do business with. Objective advice about how products really work and the ongoing monitoring of those policies is what truly sets great insurance professionals apart from well-intentioned but uninformed salespeople. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful.